This video describes the principles and performance of the ultrasound guided ankle block. The ankle block can be used to provide anesthesia and analgesia of the entire foot and ankle below the malleoli. The advantage over more proximal blocks like the popliteal sciatic nerve block is that there is no motor block of the calf muscles and patients are able to ambulate. This makes it particularly suitable for minor surgery of the foot and also for bilateral surgery. One of the traditional criticisms of the ankle block has been that it is prone to failure and is painful for the patient. This was certainly true of the landmark guided technique, but not so for the ultrasound guided technique that I describe here. I have performed this block in patients who have requested minimal or no sedation, the key being the use of small gauge sharp needles, gentle technique, and slow, accurate injection into the subcutaneous layer rather than intradermal injection. Despite the five injections, it is relatively quick to perform with a little bit of practice. Tourniquet application is the main limitation. Not all surgeons require tourniquet applications, but if they do, a calf tourniquet may be tolerated with intravenous sedation. A thigh tourniquet, however, requires general or spinal anesthesia. The ankle block may still be performed for postoperative analgesia, however. Note that for very painful surgery where the patient is not expected to wait bare in the short term, a single injection popliteal sciatic block will provide much longer analgesia and may be a better choice in this instance. There are five nerves that innervate the ankle. Starting from the posterior medial aspect and going anti-clockwise in this picture, they are the tibial nerve, saphenous nerve, deep perineal nerve, superficial perineal nerve, and the sural nerve. All but one are associated with vascular landmarks that help identification. The superficial perineal nerve, as we will see, is easily identified by its relationship to the fibula and investing fascia of the ankle. The usual preparation for any regional anesthetic procedure should be followed. A linear transducer is used. A probe with a smaller footprint may be helpful, mainly by allowing more space for needle insertion next to the probe. However, it is by no means essential and we do not use it in our adult practice. The usual injectate volume to complete blockade of all five nerves is roughly 25 to 35 milliliters. We use a one-to-one -one mix of lidocaine and bupivacaine, but without epinephrine, for surgical anesthesia. If the ankle block is being combined with general or spinal anesthesia and performed for analgesia only, bupivacaine or ropivacaine alone can be used. Unlike most other ultrasound-guided blocks, I recommend the use of a sharp hypodermic needle as it makes piercing skin and subcutaneous fascial layers much easier and less painful for the patient. The hypodermic needle may be mounted directly on the 10 mil syringe, which I personally prefer as it gives me more control over injection and removes the need for an assistant. Learning to manipulate this syringe needle assembly does take some practice, however. So if you prefer, the hypodermic needle can be connected to a short extension and held in the same way as a regular block needle with an assistant to perform the injections. If you are less confident of your ability to track and control the needle tip and are concerned about needle nerve trauma, then by all means use a 50 millimeter short beveled block needle. We perform the block with the patient supine. The ankle may be elevated using a firm support placed under the upper calf so that the foot and ankle are hanging free above the bed surface. External and internal rotation of the patient's leg at the hip allows access to the medial and external aspect of the ankle as needed. If a suitable support is not available, the patient's leg can be positioned as shown to access the medial, anterior, and lateral aspects of the ankle in turn to complete each of the five blocks. I recommend standing at the foot of the bed with the ultrasound machine on the same side of the bed as the ankle to be blocked. This allows you to keep your hands and the ultrasound screen in the same line of sight. Move around the bed as needed to access the different aspects of the ankle joint. I usually start with the tibial nerve block as it is the most important nerve of all the five nerves. The chief landmark for the tibial nerve is the posterior tibial artery, which usually lies anterior or medial to the nerve. 
Further anteriorly, you may see the tendons of the tibialis posterior and flexor digitorum longus, which should not be mistaken for the nerve. Overlying these structures is the flexor retinaculum, which has to be penetrated in order to reach the nerve. The tibial nerve innervates almost the entire sole of the foot and the majority of the deep tissues, hence it is the most important nerve to block. To ensure that the entire foot, including the hind foot and calcaneum, is blocked, the nerve must be targeted above the medial malleolus, proximal to the takeoff of the medial calcaneal nerve. The probe is placed in the groove between medial malleolus and Achilles tendon, and the nerve is scanned in a superior inferior direction along its course. This is what you'll see on ultrasound. The bony medial malleolus is recognized as a hyperechoic line with dropout shadow beneath. The posterior tibial artery and accompanying veins are visible as hypoechoic round structures. The artery is pulsatile while the veins are compressible, and color Doppler is rarely necessary for identification. Another useful landmark to look for is a triangular fascial compartment underneath the flexor retinaculum and posterior to the vessels, this will contain the tibial nerve. Anatomical variation in the position of the tibial nerve is more common than you might think. In this picture, the medial malleolus is on the right, and we see that the tibial nerve is anterior to the artery instead of posterior. What usually happens though is that as we trace the nerve proximally, the relationship changes so that the nerve eventually comes to adopt its usual position posterior to the artery. The nerve's identity may be confirmed by neurostimulation. However, the current required to elicit toe flexion is usually more than half a milliamp and more often than not in excess of one milliamp. Personally, I never use it anymore. The aim is to penetrate the triangular fascial compartment that contains the nerve. The needle may be inserted in plane or out of plane to the probe, depending on personal preference. Regardless, I always aim for the posterior corner of this compartment, tangential to the surface of the nerve, to minimize the risk of penetrating the epineurium. The end point for injection is circumferential spread of local anesthetic around the nerve, and the needle tip can be repositioned to achieve this. I tend to be more generous with my injection volume for this nerve given its importance and use 7 to 8 mils on average. This video illustrates the process. The tibial nerve is posterior to the artery within the usual triangular fascial compartment. The needle is advanced in plane in a posterior to anterior direction to pierce the fascial compartment adjacent to the nerve. If using a block needle, there will be the usual fascial pop. Injection of local anesthetic confirms the correct position of the needle tip by producing spread that outlines the contours of the nerve. With the tip at 8 o'clock to the nerve, that is spread along the inferior aspect. Repositioning the needle tip to 10 o'clock will produce spread over the superior aspect of the nerve. Ankle blocks are useful for forefoot debridements and amputations. However, these patients often have edema and soft tissue induration that can make imaging more challenging. In this ultrasound image, recognition of the usual landmarks is impaired. However, the hypoechoic posterior tibial vessels are still identifiable by their appearance and pulsatility. The expected fascial envelope around the nerve can also be distinguished if you know what to look for. And from these two landmarks, the location of the tibial nerve can be inferred. Here is a video in a patient with significant tissue edema that again contributes to poor image quality. Nevertheless, the posterior tibial artery is recognized by its pulsation. Back and forth scanning with probe tilting reveals a hyperechoic structure posterior to the artery beneath the overlying fascial layer. This is the nerve. The needle tip is located by gener generating tissue motion and by tactile feedback from puncturing the overlying fascia. Fluid injection confirms spread within the compartment around the tibial nerve.
The second nerve that I block is the saphenous nerve, which is easily done with the leg maintained in the same position as for the tibial nerve. The saphenous nerve innervates both cutaneous and deeper structures over the medial aspect of the ankle and foot. The primary landmark for the saphenous nerve is the greater saphenous vein. Both descend anterior to the tibia and medial malleolus and lie in a subcutaneous location superficial to the investing cruel fascia. The vein as well as the nerve are sandwiched between two fascial layers. It is rare to see an obvious nerve-like structure as we do here. The usual strategy, therefore, is to inject local anesthetic into the same fascial plane as the vein, which will guarantee blockade of the saphenous nerve, whether it is visible or not. The saphenous vein is easily compressed, so the probe must be held just lightly enough to obtain skin contact. A tourniquet is not usually needed, but it can help with vein distension and visualization. Insert a hypodermic needle into the correct subcutaneous layer, which is the same fascial plane that contains the vein. Inject a total of 5 mils to open up this plane, with enough force to generate a jet of local anesthetic that pushes the nerve out of the path of the needle tip. Advance the needle tip while injecting to create a transverse wheel of local anesthetic on either side of the vein. In this patient, the subcutaneous layer is one centimeter deep due to tissue edema. A blind subcutaneous injection may therefore not deposit local anesthetic in the correct plane. Ultrasound, however, clearly identifies the saphenous vein, which is large and engorged in this instance, and it is there after a straightforward process to inject local anesthetic around the vein and the nerve, which must lie somewhere adjacent to it. Continuing anti-clockwise around the ankle, the third nerve to target is the deep perineal nerve. The deep perineal nerve descends over the anterior aspect of the tibia and lies adjacent to the anterior tibial artery, which becomes the dorsalis pedis artery in the foot. The artery is the primary landmark, and the nerve may be medial or lateral or even lying on top of it, depending on the level at which the nerve is imaged. It innervates not only the skin between the first two toes, but also deeper structures in the midfoot and forefoot. The probe is placed over the anterior aspect of the tibia and scanned in a superior to inferior direction. The probe should be placed over the lower end of the tibia, proximal to the tarsal joint. Again, the probe should be braced lightly on the skin to avoid compressing the artery, which will make it difficult to locate. The upper ultrasound image here shows soft tissue deep to the anterior tibial artery, which signifies that the probe is held too low at the level of the tarsal joint. If you see this, the probe must then be slid superiorly until the bony surface of the tibia is seen directly underneath the artery, forming a backstop for the needle and a floor to contain the injection of local anesthetic. The artery is easily recognized by pulsation. The nerve is often seen on one side of the artery or above it. Even if it cannot be recognized, it is easily blocked by depositing local anesthetic on either side of the artery in the same tissue plane. I personally prefer an out-of-plane approach to the block, which is partly due to my training with landmark-guided ankle blocks, but also because I can then avoid passing the needle through the extensor tendons of the foot. Nevertheless, an in-plane approach can be used, if preferred, but try to avoid the tendons if possible. Five mils of local anesthetic is more than enough here to achieve anesthesia of the nerve. This video demonstrates the out-of-plane approach. The artery is visualized as a pulsatile structure over the tibia. The nerve is usually adjacent, but sometimes on top of the artery as it crosses over from one side to the other. We start by advancing the needle well away from the location of the artery or suspected nerve and gradual injection around the plane of the artery is done using a fanning injection technique where the needle is moved slightly in and out during injection. 
five mils of local anesthetic goes a long way here and is more than sufficient to cover the entire area. Note how in this case the nerve that lies on top of the artery becomes more visible as the local anesthetic is injected. In the edematous ankle, the artery is superficial enough that it can always be visualized. In vasculopathic patients, however, pulsatility may be faint or absent, and color Doppler will not help either due to the low flow state. Instead, it has to be identified by pattern recognition. The deep perineal nerve will be somewhere nearby, and once again though, it is sufficient to flood the area around the artery to anesthetize the nerve. Moving anti-clockwise around the ankle, the fourth nerve to target is the superficial perineal nerve. This can be done with a subcutaneous wheel across the dorsum of the foot, but this is much more painful compared to the ultrasound-guided approach that I'm about to describe. The superficial perineal nerve descends along the lateral aspect of the calf, initially deep to perineus longus in the lateral compartment of the leg. It gradually ascends to become superficial and emerges along the intermuscular septum that separates the lateral and anterior muscle compartments of the leg. At approximately the midpoint of the calf, the nerve is located in a fascial pocket underneath the investing crural fascia of the leg. As it descends more distally, it pierces this fascia to run in a subcutaneous location and branches to supply most of the dorsum of the ankle and foot. Locating the superficial perineal nerve on ultrasound is very simple. Start by placing the probe on the lateral aspect of the leg at its midpoint. It is very important to start this high up, as here is where the nerve will be consistently located below the investing crural fascia. The fibula is easily visualized. Identify its anterior corner, and then follow the septum that divides the lateral compartment from the anterior compartment all the way up to the crural fascia. The nerve will be contained within the triangular compartment that lies just deep to this fascia. The identity of the nerve is further confirmed by tracing it distally and seeing it rise to pierce the crural fascia where it lies in a subcutaneous location and subsequently divides and branches. Injection of local anesthetic will then outline the nerve clearly. In performing the block, I personally do not recommend injecting where the nerve lies in the compartment below the fascia. For one, the injection can end up intramuscular, but more important, by placing the needle tip within this small compartment, there is a risk of mechanical trauma to either the nerve or the accompanying vessels. Instead, what I recommend is that you trace it up into its subcutaneous location above the fascia where it can be easily and safely surrounded by local anesthetic without having to bring the needle tip excessively close to the nerve. Note that the nerve often has a flattened appearance, especially in slim people, but it will expand as the subcutaneous layer is distended. Insert the hypodermic needle into the subcutaneous tissue and position the tip in the correct plane. Inject with enough force to create a jet again of local anesthetic that surrounds the nerve. The needle tip does not need to touch the nerve and should not be allowed to. Here is another example of a superficial perineal nerve. Note how it's flattened in the pre-injection state. And as local anesthetic distends the space in which it lies, it starts to adopt the usual round cross section. The superficial perineal nerve remains easy to identify even in the edematous and indurated leg. Follow the sequence of steps described to locate the nerve, and it can be visualized and targeted even when the subcutaneous tissue is edematous. The fifth and final nerve to target is the sural nerve. Once again, this can be done with a subcutaneous wheel across the groove between lateral malleolus and Achilles tendon, but the ultrasound-guided approach is simple and much more accurate. The sural nerve is a branch of the tibial nerve, and at the ankle, it has a constant relationship to the lesser saphenous vein, often lying slightly medial to it, and most importantly, in the same subcutaneous fascial sheath. It innervates the skin over the lateral foot and toes and also has a lateral calcaneal branch. It can be omitted in hallux 
valgus surgery involving only the big toe, but I would recommend blocking it if surgery extends any more lateral to either the second or third toe. Internally rotate the patient's hip to improve access to the posterior lateral aspect of the ankle. Place the probe across the groove between the tibia and Achilles tendon above the lateral malleolus for better skin contact. There is a consistent fascial hammock between the Achilles tendon and perineus brevis muscle and tendon. Within this hammock lies both the lesser saphenous vein and the sural nerve. Insert the needle tip into this compartment using either an in-plane or out-of-plane approach and inject 3 to 5 mils to fill this compartment. The standard linear probe is quite wide, so a trick to avoid inserting the needle through the tendon of perineus longus and brevis is to lift the edge of the probe up, insert the hypodermic needle under direct vision into the skin, and then replace the probe on top of the needle. Slide the needle tip into the fascial hammock and then inject to fill the compartment with 3 to 5 mils of local anesthetic. Repositioning of the tip is not required. If the nerve was not visible before, it usually becomes visible once surrounded by fluid. As with all other superficial nerves at the ankle, the sural nerve is easy to block, even in the edematous leg. The fascial hammock and vein are easily visualized and targeted. That concludes this video on the ankle block. Thanks as always for watching.